let us present how a woman with Toledo ties, only briefly in Toledo, but since I think most of my viewers are Toledo pals, um, I wanted to put that, make sure we emphasize that. She became the queen of swindlers is what the headlines called her. So fun stuff there. And if you're any of my Cleveland friends, then she even more, she has even more of a connection to you guys because that's where like most of this takes place. Um, I also noticed I have a typo already, so I'm off to a good start. Yes, Granny, everybody, Gra Jensen's Granny is in the chat. She's still awake and ready to roll. I'm loving this. Late night. Let's get let's get chatting. So yeah, her name is Cassie L. Chadwick, and I keep saying she's living out the phrase "fake it till you make it." I can't even say it right. Fake it till you make it, like to the extreme. She took it all the way to the top. So let's take a look at this. In a nutshell, Cassie L. Chadwick wasn't even born Cassie, which is very uh, indicative to her nature. Her real name is Elizabeth. Bigley. So she was born in Eastwood, Ontario, Canada on October 10th, 1857. So we're going way, way back. Um, so yeah, she isn't even like, you know, she she came from the top and snuck down to try and swindle us Ohioans. And you know what? We fell for it. So like, that that's on us. Uh, she was one of the most notorious con artists in American history. So let's, let's dive into what she did. Now, her just intelligence and cunning her confidence, I guess, eventually led to the downfall of the Citizens National Bank of Oberlin. So she took from several banks what would be worth between, some reports are saying 21 and 40 million of today's dollars. I saw another source that said it would be more like 50 million of today's dollars. So she got away with some fat cash. All because of just like lying. She is a liar. So... Who is Cassie? Who is this mastermind? So as a child, she was like kind of described as quiet. She grew up on like a farm in, you know, Canada where she lived with four siblings. So she was very much in her own head and she didn't really make very many friends. As a young child, she like displayed a lot of intelligence though that would really later on lead to her... Um, her schemes, essentially, that would prove to be very helpful in the success of her schemes. So she really understood people. She didn't have that many friends, but she did a lot of observing of people. Let's start off with um, her first act of fraud, which really is going to kind of, I feel like, be a bit of foreshadowing for what she got into in the future. So... She got started pretty, pretty young. This was done at the age of 14. And think about yourself at 14. Like, we all we all did some dumb lies, right? Like, just to get out of trouble and stuff. But, like, I don't know. She was pretty darn good at this age. Like, this is, like, a multi-tiered lie. This first one, she forged a letter from this unknown uncle in England. So, this letter stated that her, her uncle, her this imaginary uncle was giving her this small amount of cash as an inheritance so obviously this wasn't true this uncle didn't exist there was no cash but th but this is what she's she's forging this letter to make it seem like she's owed this money right at this time even though she was 14 this forged letter looks pretty real right so the bank issued real checks she tricks the bank with this forged letter so she lived at 14, like this grand heiress until the note came due. So there are these promissory notes um, and, you know, you have, to, you have to pay it back. So as the months went on and she wasn't able to pay, she got caught that this was all fake. There was no uncle that was, you know, she was inheriting money from. She couldn't, she couldn't pay this, this promissory note back to the bank. So maybe they thought she was, like, too young to come up with this or maybe they thought she was a little, like, I don't know, wacky. Uh, but in any case, she, she wasn't charged in court for this one. They let her go with, you know, a little finger wag, a stern stern warning that she should never try this again, which very, very nice. 
After several years, this is where she kind of comes into our territory, our turf. She practiced in Canada. Now she's got to go scope out some other areas, and she figured Ohio, we would be the schmucks to, to go for. So she moved to the U.S. and followed her sister, Alice. So she already had somebody here. Alice married a man named Bill York, who is based in Cleveland. So that's how she ended up in our kind of the northern region of the state. So in the beginning, she lived with her. She lived with her sister, Alice, and her husband, which was very nice of them. That's what sisters should do. Um, let her go with a stern warning. Boy, have times changed. Yeah, absolutely. Stealing money from a bank nowadays? Oh, boy. Uh, random bug. Did you forge a letter to the bank to get money? Yeah, well, I see. No problem. Don't do it again. <laughs> exactly. It's we. Oh, I cannot wait until we get deeper into this because you guys are also going to be like, what? <laughs> so... Just, it gets, it gets more concerning from here. So, uh, in her sister's house, so her sister was nice enough to let her come stay. She started, like, itemizing their furniture. So, she, she basically takes, uh, you know, this, um, inventory of what her sister's got. She takes it to the bank and uses that as collateral for a bank loan. So, she's, like, basically, you know, offering up her sister's prized possessions in order to get a loan from the bank that she knows she won't be able to pay back. So really, yeah, her sister would lose all of her things. So as soon as Alice's husband, Bill, got a whiff of that, boom, done. She's out. Like, obviously, can't blame Bill for that. So, yeah, she, she ruined that, that nice little setup pretty quick. Now she's on her own. So this is where she decides, I'm going to reinvent myself right? Every woman goes through that phase. They want to reinvent themselves. They chop their hair, you know, maybe they go for a bold lip or something, right? But she, she's coming up. She's no, she's a clairvoyant named Madame Lydia Devere. You know, she, she's, she doesn't just do, you know, a little style change. She is taking on a persona. So during this time as Madame Devere, she meets Dr. Wallace Springsteen, who is her first husband. Um, I know you can, what you can itemize that large poofy, poofy, floofy hat. Yeah, right? Like she's, why didn't she just offer up her, her giant fashionable hat? You're right, random bug. She probably had, she had some stuff of her own. I guarantee you she did, but no, she wanted to offer off her, her sister's stuff because no, she can't, she can't give the bank her own things to get a loan the right way. She's, she's Madame Devere. Come on. So. She meets her husband. They get married November 21st, 1882. Now these wedding pictures are posted in the Plain Dealer, the Akron Plain Dealer. Uh, so people she knows, like she obviously, she came to Cleveland as herself. She knew people. People saw her picture. They recognized her. They're like... People came hunting down, like, because she owed people money. Someone who's a fraudster, like, she, she owes people money. So people who needed her were able to then track her down. They saw the picture. They saw her new, like, location. They saw her new persona. And they're like, oh, there she is. Boom. Tracked her down. Um, even her sister Alice was like, there she is. You know, I'm just picturing them angry mobbing. So through this... Uh, the whole debacle, her new husband uncovered her shady past. So he's like, oh, this isn't what I signed up for. So he was kind enough to settle all of her debts. What a guy, right? But he did end up divorcing her, which, yeah, fair. So he left her just 12 days after their wedding. So, you know, Kim Kardashian who, right? So, they, yeah, she was married for a good old 12 days, but he paid off her debt, so win on her part, right? So, that doesn't, you know, Madame Devere, she didn't work out, right? So now, now she's reinventing again. Meet Madame LaRose. That new name, you know, Devere, lame. LaRose, she's going to be on to better things. So after Springsteen fell apart, she decided to, you know, again, reinvent herself, find this new persona. But she's sticking to her story as being a clairvoyant. So she eventually met two husbands this way. So LaRose was a pretty good bet. The first one was a country farmer 
named John R. Scott, with whom she stayed married for four years. Now, I don't know how that marriage fell apart. It probably, it genuinely probably had something to do with the fraud because it seems like a, a real problem. So after they divorced, she married a businessman, C.L. Hoover. And people are kind of guessing that he's the father of her only son, Emil Hoover. So, yeah, she has w one son, one boy, one beautiful baby boy. Um, and they believe it's it's Hoover's, Hoover's kid. So she stayed with Hoover until he he died. So he died in 1888. Then she moved to T-Town. She moved to Toledo, the 419. And then she flip-flopped back to her original, not name, but her original fake persona as Lydia DeVere. She went back. She says, let's, let's give this another go. I didn't, I didn't get a fair shot with DeVere. So she started, once again, forging promissory notes worth several thousand dollars and asked a client Joseph Lamb to cash it for her. So Mr. Lamb had this great reputation, right? He was an upstanding citizen. The banks, they trusted him. They had no reason not to. So they cashed him her fraudulent checks. Uh, remember, if at first Madame Devere doesn't work, buy another poofy floofy hat and change your last name. Always works. Yes, that that's the moral of this story. Just that doesn't work. Change your name. Get a bigger hat. Bada bing, bada boom. Fraudulent checks through the bank. So, however, the banks caught on. They figured they figured out that this nice upstanding gentleman was cashing fraudulent checks in uh, this, this young lady's name. So they were both arrested. So in 1889, we remember, I know there's like 12 names out there already. Her birth name is Elizabeth Bigley. So Elizabeth Bigley was sentenced to nine and a half years in prison for this fraud. This isn't a big one yet, guys. This is just, you know, small time stuff, but she got nine and a half years. Now, this poor guy, Lamb, who was cashing these checks for her, was acquitted, thankfully, after having been found an unwitting accomplice. Like, he didn't know. He didn't know these were fraudulent checks. She swindled him because he had good, like, credit, good, I, yeah, I guess probably not credit, but, you know, he had good reputations and everything. So he got tricked into it. Thankfully, the courts figured that out and he was, you know, he was fine, but she was in jail. After serving several years in jail, she wrote a letter to Governor William McKinley to plead her case. And he actually did pardon her in 1893, thinking that she turned over a new leaf. So, yeah, she got out of jail. Uh, par she was pardoned. And she didn't stop. <laughs> like, oh, oh, she turned over a new leaf. No, she tricked him. She swindled him like she swindled everybody else. No, this Madame DeVere... She had more frauds to commit. This is the biggest fraud of her life. So, so let's let's get into this. Upon her release from jail, she returned to Cleveland. You know, the place she had she had the most success as Mrs. Cassie Hoover. So, she went back to her first the first name that she liked, and then she stuck with Hoover, her most recent married name. So, she opened up this brothel and it was there that she met her next husband. She was just picking up husbands left and right, killing it. So she married Dr. Leroy Chadwick. They married in 1897. Now, Dr. Chadwick had lots of money. You know, that's, that's her MO. That's what she likes. They lived along Cleveland's Euclid Avenue, which was then known as Millionaire's Row. So she lived in a swank house. Look at this thing. Look at this. This is where she lived with our boy Leroy, Leroy Chadwick. She plopped on in and all of a sudden she was set. You would think that would be enough, right? She wanted the money. Now she doesn't even need to like swindle people out of it. Wow, she's married. She married into money. Just like let it be. She's already like, you know, millionaire row. So she couldn't stop with just being a millionaire. So as Chadwick's wife, she really started to get a taste of the high life, right? Like she was, she was feeling it. Her neighbors along, you know, millionaires row were affluent. They were classy. And she tried so hard to fit in. She really wanted to be one of them. She coveted like more than, you know, what she already had. So to, to do this in order to like, she, she, she just like basically had a taste and she was addicted and she wanted to like 
get further and further and further up the ladder. So she pretended to be Andrew Carnegie's illegitimate daughter. And it's not just based on like, oh, the lie to sound cool. It gets deep. So as a just frame of reference, Andrew Carnegie was a Scottish American industrialist and he was considered one of the richest men in American history. So she picked big rich guys. She's like, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Right? So here, the story that that had come to be, that had come to pass, she was an illegitimate something. Right. <laughs> the illegitimate part, correct. But the Carnegie part, not so much. Yeah. Um, was everyone facial blind? I don't know, man. It's like... Everyone here is so naive, it's insane. Like, everyone in this story, and I guess at the time, just the naivety is, like, astounding. So, the story was that she met this acquaintance of her husband, a banker named Dylan. Dylan, poor innocent Dylan, in the lobby of Holland House. So, she asked this Dylan to accompany her to the mansion of Andrew Carnegie in Fifth Avenue. So, they got to, they, they went to the mansion they got to the mansion, she went inside, and she spoke to one of the housekeepers. Now, at this point, Dylan was not inside. He, he accompanied her there. She went inside, and she spoke to one of uh, Carnegie's housekeepers. So she managed to stay in there and have this conversation for like 30 minutes, you know, half an hour. She's just in there. And poor Dylan's just outside, you know, looking at his watch. I don't know, pocket, they had probably a pocket watch back then. So, after Cassie emerged from this mansion, she pretended, instead of speaking to the housekeeper, she told Dylan that she had actually been speaking with Andrew Carnegie himself. So, she then presented this fake promissory note worth millions of dollars, signed by none other than Mr. Carnegie. So... She waltzes inside, talks to the housekeeper, buys some time, waltzes back out, and was like, look at this promissory note from Mr. Carnegie. I just spoke with him. But why? Why on earth would she, you know, how how would that make sense? Why would she walk out with Carnegie's little note? Well, she told him, I'm his illegitimate daughter, and he's giving me this note because he feels bad and he's embarrassed. So it was a secret. It was this big secret. And she pressured Dylan into maintaining its secrecy, you know. She, she made it seem like it was this hush-hush thing. And, you know, she's trusting him to know and all of this. But in fact, you know, she told him that not only was she his illegitimate daughter, but she was set to inherit $400 million after Carnegie died. She's like, look, I'm his illegitimate daughter. He's giving me these little notes. I'm going to inherit a boatload of cash when he dies. Obviously, I mean, we all know that's not true. So this is just to make sure we're on the same page. Not true. Um, She would thrive in today's omelet. She would be the ultimate troll. It would be glorious. She would stir up so much garbage and like on Twitter, especially. Oh my God. She would, she would, Twitter would be like her, her sanctuary, right? So this is where it gets frustrating, okay? This Dylan guy, just out of politeness, he hears this wild story. If this if this person says all this to you, wouldn't you be like, okay, this doesn't seem right. He, out of politeness, he's like, he never bothered to verify. He never bothered. He's like, oh, okay, yes, I, I believe you. I, I respect you. I don't think you're lying. So he never tried to verify this with Carnegie himself. He wanted to believe her. So basically, (laughs) he like verified this and checks were issued from various banks based on this forged note. It's working. She has this forged note from Mr. Carnegie saying that she's owed millions of dollars and these banks are giving her this money that she just faked. So the information ended up leaking to the financial markets in all of like the Northern Ohio region. So banks began to offer their services up, bing, bang, boom. And for the next eight years, like that's a good chunk of time, eight years, she used her fake background to get loans that eventually totaled to around 2 million bucks. Back then, that's an insane amount of money, right? 
So Chadwick relied on just the assumption that no one would go ask Carnegie about these checks, about her status, um, you know, because it's a like she's a rumored illegitimate daughter. So they didn't think they'd go asking him about it because they didn't want to embarrass him because he's like the richest man in America, right? Like he's like loaded. So he has a lot of status and offending somebody like that is like, ooh, you know, don't want to do that. Who wants to go and embarrass like the guy with like all the money? Nobody wants to do that. So the loans also came with like these crazy interest rates. Bankers assumed that Carnegie would vouch for basically any debts that they would be fully repaid once he died. So <laughs> they basically just, they made all of these assumptions. And she knew that they would do that. Because like, she's so, she's just so attuned to how people are. And she's done these frauds. She knows how people think. She knew the culture of the time. She, she just knew, she knew what she was doing. So she played, she played them. She was banking on the assumption that they wouldn't bother to pester him because also who comes up with that lie who has got that like kind of the gumption you know so uh wow just wow right it's it's insane the I almost feel like if everybody's gonna fall for it like good for her good for her for going for it because they didn't do any diligence like that's a ton of money that they're just handing over to her and they didn't even give him a phone call not even a phone call or a letter you know to be like hey Mr. Carney, is this, is this, I just want to double check. They, you're get, they don't even need to mention the illegitimate daughter just to this person. Like, say her name. It's like such an easy solution. And they don't do any of it. So, again, she would get, she'd been getting that money for like eight years. So she carried out this lavish lifestyle. Like, she was already, again, living a millionaire's row just because of her husband's money. But now she had her own massive fortune that she was like, able to do whatever she wanted with so she bought diamond necklaces enough clothes to fill 30 closets and a gold organ which I would love to see a picture of like that is like royalty stuff a gold organ I don't know to me that's what I would picture yeah like like for a, for a queen or something which uh she was actually some some people said like called her the queen of Ohio um but I don't know, some things said that. And then she, she, like, she claimed that she gave a lot of money to, like, charities and, like, to help the women's suffrage movement. But no, she was just buying herself garbage with her fake money. I would think a lot of people would get fired over this, right? You would think so. I wonder where the gold organ is today. Good question. Let's Google it after this. Don't let me forget. I, I wonder, it's got to be somewhere, right? Like, it has to be... I bet you just got like auctioned off and some rich schmuck owns it. But I'm very curious. So what she kind of did was at the time she was moving money around bank to bank. So the banks were like loaning her this money based on the note that it would be paid back when she got her inheritance. So when one loan basically was due, she'd use another loan to pay it off. And so she was just switching all of this money from bank to bank to bank making it seem like she was paying something off when she just, she wasn't. She wasn't paying it off. So she kept borrowing based on these forged notes that she kept getting from her illegitimate Carnegie father. And no no one asked questions. They were just like, yeah, this is, you know, this is our girl. You know, she's got these notes. It's fine. Until eventually someone did ask a question. Someone did. And that was a man named Herbert B. Newton, our boy. So this is where things really start to unravel for our, for our poor, sweet queen of swindlers. So Newton was a Massachusetts banker. And so he eventually, he did issue Cassie a $190,000 loan in 1904. Now when her loan was due, she couldn't pay. So he realized something was wrong he's like "Uh uh-oh this is mm -mm, nope something's up so he finally uncovered the truth so the securities in her name were worthless he discovered he figured it out she had used up all the money that she borrowed to fund this lavish lifestyle that she could not afford and she was never going to pay it back like just imagine that realization that this like you had just been going based on this assumption and 
it's like everything, your eyes open, they are never getting any of this money back. It's gone. So this actually led to the doom of Citizens National Bank of Oberlin. Now this bank had loaned her $800,000 and knew at this point they figured out she was never going to be able to give that back. So this like their other clients began to piece that together as well. So they started taking their money out of the bank before like something goes awry. So this caused a bank like this basically like led to their bankruptcy. There's nothing left anymore. It was gone. The bank was done. And so she effectively just ruined. She ruined that bank with her her long con. She was sure smarter than those bankers. Oh my God, a thousand percent. Like, I don't know. Again, like maybe they just weren't expecting like a woman to carry out these calculated crimes. I... I maybe she was just good in person too I think she was really good at manipulating people and making herself seem very genuine so they just wanted to trust her but that's just I mean we know now banks don't work that way anymore so she's probably why so later you know basically the bank sued so she's she's going to trial you know, obviously. So when Carnegie was later asked about her, he he was like, I, I don't know this person. Finally, someone's asking. No, I don't know her. And he said he hadn't signed any kind of like promissory note in more than 30 years. So no way. She ended up fleeing to New York to try and avoid this trial. But she was soon arrested at her apartment at the hotel and taken back to Cleveland. So she was drugged back, back to Cleveland. So when she was arrested... <laughs> She was actually wearing a money belt that contained over a hundred thousand bucks. God, she is just such a baller. It's like so it's just so impressive. So remember, she was married, right? She's married to our, our boy Leroy Chadwick. And uh so Leroy and his adult daughter, so not not uh Cassie, cat no relation to Cassie, uh, they they left Cleveland. They're like, we are avoiding this frenzy they were like we're gonna go to Europe for a bit uh so he he did file for divorce before leaving on the tour though so that was probably a good move so the news sent like shockwaves through the Cleveland banking community it was like a media media circus right so Carnegie attended Chadwick's trial wishing to see the woman who successfully conned the bankers into believing that she was his heir wouldn't you Like, when you hear this story, all this money, and this whole time she's been claiming to be a relative, I'd be curious, too. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go. Let me go. Let me look at her. Let me see. Let me see what she's got going on. Um, Other attendees, including members of the Millionaire's Row families, from who she tried so hard to gain acceptance. So, how embarrassing. It would be really hard, I think, to look the person in the face who you've been claiming to get all this money from. Like, he was, like, the crux of her con, and he shows up. That would be really difficult and then all of her friends who she did all this like impress them and I mean that wasn't really the main reason but it was it was part of the reason you know she wanted to fit in she wanted to feel like she was one of them um that would be I think the ultimate humiliation especially for someone um um, like her right um she was eventually on March 10th sentenced to 14 years in prison and a fine of seventy thousand dollars and, like, one of the, the the main charge was conspiracy to bankrupt the Citizens National Bank, which, I mean, she did. I don't think, I mean, that's kind of silly because I feel like that's, she wasn't conspiring to bankrupt them. She was just conspiring to get herself money. <laughs> like, the bank was just, like, collateral, right? Why don't you just wake up each day wondering if today was the day you'd be found out? Right. That is a really good point because I'm sitting there like, I'm not good at lying. I don't like breaking rules and I feel like the guilt and the weight of having something like that on you and not even just the guilt but like the yeah just the fear that somebody could be sniffing around like you're gonna mess up one thing you're gonna slip up somebody's gonna notice something so maybe someday someone's gonna man up and ask Carnegie himself and everything unravels but I think for maybe some people the short thrill might be worth it or the risk you know, the reward is greater than that risk for them. And I guess she had, like, 
really been able to get away with it most of her life. Like she served some jail time, but she was even able to swindle away out of that. I think people get cocky and they think that they can just do it and get away and they're smarter than everybody else. So on January 1st, 1906, she was sent to the Ohio State Penitentiary in Columbus. So she was, she was, you know, not too far. She brought with her trunks of goods for a prison cell, like uh, clothes, pictures, furniture, and, you know, I, this isn't 100% confirmed, but apparently the, the warden allegedly allowed this because she was considered a celebrity, which I feel like is kind of a stupid reason. So at some point, her health started to deteriorate, and she started writing very explicit instructions for her funeral. She instructed her son, or she had the one son with, with our boy Hoover, to send a portion of her hidden funds, of course she's got hidden funds, to Canada for the purchase of a tombstone for the family plot, because remember, she was born in Canada. So she apparently, on September 17th, 1907, suffered a, quote, nervous collapse, and she was left blind. So then uh, the New York Times reported on October 9th that she has started suffering from heart and stomach problems. So she really was starting to, to follow apart. Um, I guess it was hard to stop when she kept getting away with it right. And she kept, you, you notice every time she's like upping it a little bit, you know, she's pushing it a little bit further. When Brandon Bug, Chadwick to husband, look like they're on to me. What should I do? Chadwick's husband to Chadwick. Yeah, I'm going to go on vacation forever. <laughs> exactly. They're noping. They straight up noped out of that. They wanted nothing to do with it. Um, so like I said, her health was deteriorating. So then in October of 1907, she did, she did eventually die in the uh, Columbus Penitentiary at age 50. So she was pretty young. She left behind, you know, quite a legacy. So for a, for a while, the mansion that she had been, you know, on Millionaire's Row became a tourist spot, which I'm betting is where <laughs> the organ stayed for quite some time. Like, it was probably some kind of, like, museum situation. In the early 1920s, it was torn down for the construction of the Euclid Avenue Temple. So, you know, it, did, it turned into a church. So, a feature film, which I didn't know this, premiered last year in September. So if there's a whole film on her life called The Duchess of Criminality, and it's on Netflix. I'm, I don't know. I didn't see if it was still on Netflix, but I know it premiered on Netflix in September of last year. How did we miss it? This is such an interesting story, and I feel like they didn't hype any of it up. Maybe the movie sucks, but now I want to watch it. Chadwick was a subject also of a Canadian TV movie, which, of course, Love and Larceny. That's a cool name. What a gal.